It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson's here to talk about, yes, even more Spectre-related attacks. Highlights from last Tuesday's monthly patch event. GPS spoofing. Yeah, it's as bad as it sounds. And he was take, blown away by the amount of detail revealed in last Friday's Department of Justice indictment against Russian act, uh, spies, basically. Um, he talks about that, too. It's all coming up next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 672, recorded Tuesday, July 17th, 2018. All up in their business. Security Now is brought to you by IT Pro TV, flexible and entertaining training for your IT career. Visit itpro.tv slash security now, use a code SN30, and you'll get a free seven-day trial plus 30% off a monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. And by Duo Security. Give anytime, anywhere access to applications based on the trustworthiness of users and devices with Duo Beyond, the Zero Trust security platform. Sign up for a free trial at duo.com. It's time for security now. Yay! The <laughs> highlight of the week for many of you. I know Steve Gibson is here and we're ready to talk about a world at war. <laughs> well, <laughs> so... This was actually initially titled uh, More Spectre Madness, because believe it or not, there is oh. more Spectre Madness. Oh. Uh, two researchers uh, affiliated with MIT won a $100,000 reward just recently by Intel. Remember that, that, that Intel put up a bounty. I think it was a quarter million dollar right, bounty right. for through the end of the year – for any additional discoveries. Well, we had some. And so that was all sort of set up to talk, to make that be the big deal. But then I started reading the 29 page DOJ indictment, which we got last Friday uh, against the 12 Russian agents who were, it is alleged, hacked into the the democratic side of the 2016 US election and what stunned me was the i mean and almost it's almost chilling is the degree of detail and and of course we're all about technology on the podcast we and all of our listeners and so so it just changed the subject of the podcast now i'm calling it uh, this this Security Now number 672 for July 17th is titled All Up in Their Business. <laughs> what because does that mean? <laughs> we are all up in the Russian business. Oh. Um, I could not believe. I mean, on this day between this time and that time, such and so did the following Google searches in a uh, uh, upstream by three hours oh, of uh, like to research some English to get the English right on a blog posting uh, where they were uh, where they created the Guccifer 2.0 identity uh, in order to rebut the WikiLeaks claims and blah blah blah. But I mean the the level of detail. I mean, if I were the Russians, I'd be looking around thinking, what? I mean, and of course, this is it's always. A problem because in when you divulge this sort of detail, there's this there's this you know assumption of source of sources and methods, and so oftentimes you're wanting to keep what you know somewhat under wraps because if you if you say too much, then like there can only be one or two ways such and such is known. But anyway, so so we're gonna wrap up this week by by taking a look at. Uh, some of the allegations in the indictment, but what's stunning to, to me and any technologist who listens to the podcast would be, okay, wait a minute. How, how do they know that? I mean, like how retrospectively, because this wasn't known at the time 
this had to be forensically like gone back and figured out, which suggests a number of things that we'll talk about, about the level of monitoring of the Internet that this suggests we have, which, uh, you know, makes Edward Snowden look like he was, you know, using training wheels. Uh, I mean, it's just ast astonishing. Wow. So anyway, uh, but other things happen, too. As I mentioned, we have new specter related attacks. We've got some highlights from last Tuesday's monthly patch event. A couple interesting advances in GPS spoofing technology where the researchers went beyond like telling someone to turn left in the middle of a freeway, which is like what? Uh, to actually figuring out how to spoof GPS to the level required mm. to give somebody b believable, workable, alternate driving routes to take them somewhere to the spoofers of, of the spoofers choosing, which opens up a whole, oh, and for less than $300 for like just using a Raspberry Pi and a, a, a software defined radio. I mean, so like the, the bar has been lowered and the capability expanded. So we're sort of just keeping ourselves up to date on what's possible. Uh, GitHub also added another piece to their very welcome help with informing repository owners or managers of dependency problems with their projects. Chrome apparently has pushed out, but it did they didn't push it out to me. So I don't know. It's supposed to be 99% pushed, but they didn't get I don't know. I don't know why I don't have it. But something known as site isolation has been added that we're going to talk about. Um, also, I I keep saying when we're talking about how how Shodan can be used to find vulnerable routers that traffic can be bounced off of. Our listeners have heard me saying, yeah, just wait till those hackers start looking inside the networks that of the routers that they're just currently bouncing traffic off of. Well, that happened and with some interesting consequences. Also, there's been a Portuguese ISP abusing their role as a as a as a internet uh, exchange point. Uh, well, they're no long, they're now dark. Nobody is sending them any traffic anymore. We'll talk about that. Um, and then wrap up talking about, oh, I did have a follow up to last week's discussion of using Spinrite with a big uh, with a raid where, the guy who wanted to run Spinrite on his drives didn't want to take his raid down overnight. Um, somebody who knows some details about the way that raid works uh, came up with a way that doesn't require a big rebuild afterwards. So I wanted to share that. And then we'll talk about uh, <laughs> this, this stunning 29-page uh, document that, uh, I mean, it's just, it's amazing what, uh, what we know. So, yikes. Really interesting stuff. Yes. And we can show you the illustration, which you won't be able to read. Won't be able to read, but you get a, a, the sense of the connectivity. Yeah, yes, our picture yeah. of the week. Yeah, that's coming up. But first, a word from, of course, IT Pro TV. I always mention the fact that IT Pro TV probably has the highest density of overlap with our Security Now audience. We went to the uh, opening of their new studios a few months ago ago in uh, Gainesville. And as I told you, Steve, everybody said, say hi to Steve. <laughs> They're all your best buddies. And I don't just mean the people working at IT Pro TV, but that's for sure, but also all their customers. I mean, there were hundreds of people there and they seemed to, to a person to be fans of security now. I guess there's just a natural relationship. If you're interested in technology and security and IT, you, you listen to this show. If you want a job in technology or security or IT, then you should be watching IT Pro TV too. IT Pro TV is the best way to either get that first job in IT or accelerate your career. It's the best, most entertaining, most binge-worthy IT training you've ever heard of. And man, do they cover everything. They're doing, as I said, they have five active studios. That means they're recording producing and streaming live. You can watch it live 
125 hours a week. There are now more than 4,000 hours of timely, high-quality, on-demand training in their library for everything, from all the CompTIA certs, like A+, to the uh, EC Council, that's the Certified Ethical Hacker certs, VMware. New content is always added, so you'll always be up to date. They just updated their CCNA routing and switching archive. About 90 hours, nine zero hours of new Cisco content. And by the way, these trainers are really good. They're the, they're the subject matter experts. And they're really good, entertaining, engaging teachers. If you watch Security Now live, you know that there's a chat room that goes along with it. Same thing at IT Pro TV. You're chatting along with other IT professionals and people who want to get into IT. So it's a great way to meet, you know, your peers you can watch anywhere, too. Of course, on your computer at itpro.tv, but you can watch on Chromecast. Uh, you, they have iOS and Android apps. You can cast them right to your TV. They've got a Roku app, Fire TV app, Apple TV app. <laughs> uh, they just op updated the iOS and tvOS app with improved UI, a personalized My Feed, so you can kind of keep going with what you're watching for your recent viewings and more. You'll and if you've got a team, IT Pro TV is great for keeping them up to date. A lot of big businesses and many universities, Harvard signed up uh, their entire IT department to IT Pro TV. They have a pro portal. The IT Pro TV pro portal gives you complete control over your team's training schedule. You could track their results, make sure people are doing the work, see metrics like logins, viewing time, courses viewed, tracks completed. If you've already, you know, got the cert, IT Pro TV will help you learn the skills to pass the next cert and kickstart a lucrative career in IT. Now 100,000 members strong. IT Pro TV, just choose the plan you want, create an account, enjoy the journey. You want to know more? we got a great trial for you. ITPro.tv slash security now. That's the website. ITPro.tv slash security now. You can learn more about the team solution there. You can request a free team trial. If you want an individual monthly membership, you can get a seven-day free trial there. ITPro.tv slash security. Now, do use the code SN30 because that will also give you 30% off your subscription for the lifetime of your active subscription. So that means like the standard subscription is $570 a year. It would be down to $399 a year. When you go to ITPro.tv slash security now, use the code SN30. Flexible training. Binge-worthy content, life-changing results, and this is a this is just a great group you want to be part of. ITPro.tv slash security now. Don't forget that offer code that'll give you a 30% discount. SN30. Okay, Steve Arena. Well, so our picture of the week isn't, as you said, super informative because it <laughs> it is it is the best resolution I could find. Um, but it's blurry, so I didn't like expand it. It's just not very clear. But it it does show the interconnection of the various players in this drama. Um, you know what roles they had, uh, where their identities were used, and so forth. So it's just sort of you I know mean, it's the sort of thing we see with with forensic investigations where you know. Who was in charge of what and who called who and who, uh, you know, had which identities and so forth. Uh, the the details in the text are very clear uh, and we'll be talking about that in a few minutes. Um, I did want to mention, as I said at the top of the show, that uh, and also, as I said at the top of the year, about the speculative exe execution problems that that the problem is way is like fundamental to the architecture of today's processors. And I, the, as, as I've thought about this more and I read this paper, these guys, they earned their hundred thousand dollars, their bounty, uh, awarded by Intel for this work. It is the clearest and most, well, I would say damning, uh, or worrisome or earth shaking, indictment of 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 any sort of tricks which are played for speculation that i've seen they i, I would i would argue they have advanced the state of the art in this paper significantly 
Um, and the and there's really no immediate takeaway for us because the good news is <clears throat> end users, as we know, have never really been at too much risk. The big risk is where there's the potential to have an adversary sharing the same processor. Well, since in a single user system, like we're all using with our laptops and desktops and our mobile devices, you know, we're the only one using it. So if malware is in the device, well, you know, we're already compromised. But in a, in a cloud, uh, in, in a virtual server, virtual machine cloud environment where the design of the system is multiple customers sharing the same hardware, the, 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 the problem of cross, the cross VM information leakage, which had until the beginning of the year been just assumed because we had, we had implemented the architectures to isolate processes, that process and, and machine isolation was a given. And it was, you know, the rare exception. I remember there was a, a floppy driver a few years ago in the VMware where <clears throat> you could give it some weird uh, instructions and break into the to, to the kernel. I mean, but that was the exception to this isolation rule. Where I'm going with this is that I wouldn't be surprised if moving forward, the only way we solve this problem is by not allowing sharing of a core and the core's resources, which means it's caching also, uh, among, among systems that may be hostile to each other. I just, I, the, the whole point of speculation is that this processor learns what it's doing and is better at doing it in the future. That's what caching gives us. It's what branch prediction gives us. It's, it's what all of these tricks where we have a, where, where the system only runs at the performance it does because it's remembering, it, it, it's taking advantage of the fact that code that has just run tends to run again. Without that, we don't, we, we're, you know, main memory is just incredibly slow relative to the processor speed, which is why we have all these multi-meg caches now in order to bring that local. I just don't see how it's possible to share that um, without carefully tagging which core owns which items in the cache, which could be done, um, and possibly just giving up on the idea of a multi-core processor being considered as a symmetric thread pool where anybody can run any th thread from any core. It may be necessary to partition in the future, to partition in, in these environments where hostility is possible, to partition cores to virtual machines so that there just isn't cross-core leakage because I can't see any way for someone to, sh to securely share a single core. Not and, and given that we need speculation, <clears throat> unless everything was tagged. And frankly, tagging everything would not reduce performance and it would solve the problem, but at ho horrendous hardware expense. That is, you know, to... Right now, the presumption has been there was no need to tag everything. And by that, when I say tagging, I mean identify which process caused what modification for the future, which will, would, again, if the tags match, we, we reuse what we learned of that process. Uh, another process is not going to be using the same architecture. So we actually could see an improvement in overall performance by heavily tagging what what the processor learns about what the processes are doing on it 
that be, and we would get a performance benefit because we wouldn't be flushing the the what we learn from one process by another, which would be a benefit. But boy, it and it doesn't really it's it's not a conceptual um, stretch. Everybody knows how to do a fully tagged system, but it would expand the die size and increase the complexity of the hardware significantly. It 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 either that or part uh, or or strict processor partitioning is probably where we have to go. Anyway, so I'll just say that what these guys did, they named these two new findings which fell out of their very powerful research. They called them Spectre 1.1 and 1.2 um, <clears throat> because they're related to the original Spectre 1 flaw. Spectre 1 was all about speculative reads. What they realized was speculative stores could be used to in a similar fashion. And so they've they've extended our understanding of the the the, the speculation risk significantly by by essentially by not missing anything in their analysis and and what's significant to us well or to the industry is that the their approach bypasses the mitigations with the software mitigations which were put in place to solve the Spectre 1.0 problems, meaning that, that that there is no current protection from what these guys have done. And uh, at the same time, there also never was, as we've said, a huge risk to end users. The risks have been bigger to cloud providers. Um, and so I don't know whether Intel will respond whether they can. Um, it may be that we'll see another round of software mitigations. We might see more microcode again, thinking that we were finally done at you know after half a year of this microcode mess that we went through. Um, uh, this just happened. So there is yet no real sense. Um, Intel has acknowledged that they, well, uh, in, in addition to paying $100,000, they've acknowledged that, yes, their systems are vulnerable to the these two 1.1 and 1.2 vulnerabilities, as has ARM. AMD so far has been silent, but AMD is traditionally slower to respond to security issues. They're, you know, looking at it, I'm sure, and will probably end up saying, uh, yeah, well, this gets us too. Because basically... This is just puts another nail in the in the speculation coffin, and it it I mean the the, the paper is amazing. If any again, I will just I've got a link in the show notes for anyone who's interested. It's it's a tour de force in in really understanding the nature of this problem and and argues convincingly that there isn't as I said there just isn't a, a safe way to do this if. If something your code does changes the future and it has to in order to get the performance it needs, then if your if that changed future is can also affect a different process, you've got cross process information leakage. And as we saw recently and as these guys reiterated in their paper, things like fuzzing the timing in in the browsers only slow down the the bandwidth or the bit rate of information leakage it didn't end it so it's still a problem anyway really really great work and in fact uh bleeping computer uh covered this and had on their page a really nice summary of where we've been so far this year uh uh, with the variant one, and now we have 1.1, 1.2, and of course we have two, three, three A, and four, uh, and so it just you know, and four was remember Spectre Next Generation or Spectre NG. Um, so uh, no yet, no word yet on AMD's effect, nor anyone's formal response. This is just this all just happened, but 
there's no reason to panic because as we've seen, even the original problems were more of a computer science concern that 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 we had to take seriously because everything we've learned says these problems only get worse as they add. And this is what we're seeing. I mean, now, you know, as our understanding seven months later is continuing to mature, uh, it's looking to be bleaker than we even thought. So hats off to these guys. And I and I they really did earn their hundred grand from Intel. And thank you, to Intel, for offering a bounty. I'm sure they would have done the research anyway, but uh, uh, this, if, if it encourages people to spend the time, which is, which was extensive in this case to understand it, then yay. Um, last Tuesday was the second Tuesday of the month and Microsoft fixed 53 vulnerabilities occurring across 15 of their products. Um, they were just, you know, Nothing really stood out except I did want to close the loop on the a, a topic we discussed a couple of weeks before, which was the lazy FP state restore. Um, this was a, yet another vulnerability, uh, not technically speculative, but this was the one where um, Intel added a feature where if – where the expensive to restore state of the floating point unit due to all of the large registers that floating point math uses, um, having to reload them when a thread starts to execute is expensive. And so someone somewhere, I'm sure, did some some profiling years ago and said, hey, you know, uh, Sometimes a thread gets execution and it never does any FPU stuff. So let's not bother to restore the FPU registers unless it tries. Anyway, so yes, there's another optimization. And sure enough, it can be abused in order to leak information, as we saw. So Microsoft did issue a patch for that, essentially not taking advantage of that um, at that optimization. And as we also mentioned when we just when we talked about it the first time, um, a number of other OSs had already decided the edge wasn't even worth the complexity that it added. So they had backed off and, and were never affected by it. So now after after last week, Windows isn't either. The, the winner of last week's patch Tuesday was Adobe. Uh, who fixed more than twice as many vulnerabilities, count them, 112. And and also what was interesting was how lopsided their location uh, was. Almost all of them were in Adobe Acrobat and Reader. They published two for Flash Player, three for their Experience Manager, three for Connect, and the balance... 104 vulnerabilities were fixed in Acrobat and Reader, um, and you know, the, and we would we would argue that Acrobat and Reader are Adobe's largest interpreters, and as we know, interpreters are notoriously difficult to to make work in a way that prevents their abuse. And sure enough. Um, uh, and what I'm interested in knowing, uh, there's no information about this and without a lot of digging, it would certainly be possible to determine, but I'm wondering how far back the vulnerabilities go and how many of them were introduced in the last, oh, say, 10 years, because we had Acrobat Reader 10 years ago and it worked just great. <laughs> and, you know, PDFs popped up and, and you could read PDFs and and everything seemed fine. And I just wonder if if you know what percentage of these are new problems that Adobe has introduced into their own software as a consequence of continually adding new features because that's what they have to do for their own corporate interest. I I just wish you know, once the bugs are out, they would leave it alone 
because as we know, uh, we had that E equals MC squared uh, picture of the week a few weeks back. Uh, and we know that the, the, the number of security vulnerabilities tends to increase exponentially uh, as code continues to grow in size because it's just difficult to keep everything uh, straightened out and not interacting with each other. Um, anyway, so that so all of those are fixed. I'm sure everyone has updated Windows by now. And of course, as we know, it's becoming increasingly important to do so. Eh, maybe not for the typical end user, but certainly if you're if you're in any sort of a uh, an attack target. And I'll mention that I'll make sure to mention it when we're talking about the the way uh, the Russian agents managed to get into these systems. Uh, nothing was super high tech or fancy. Largely, it was social engineering, and um, uh, and I just completely distracted myself and lost my the, the, <laughs> what were you looking the, at? Squirrel. the thread. Yeah, it's like Squirrel. okay, where am I going? What, what, what is that about? <laughs> and, uh, I have no idea. Uh, oh, about the about the, if you were if you might be the target of attacks, then. You really, you know, we know that when vulnerabilities are patched, they are now often very quickly reverse engineered to figure out what it is they fixed. And there's a, then a window of opportunity be, opens during which time from the time the vulnerability is known to the time the target system actually gets updated, someone can ha can be taken advantage of. Um, and, and if nothing else, um, as a consequence of all the press that has occurred in the wake of the U.S. election two years ago, um, there can't be any naivete on the part of those involved in in the political system. The as we will see here by the end of the podcast, you know, people were clicking on links they shouldn't have, and 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 you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the the rest now is the consequence is, is the subject of an indictment with lots of details. Um, okay, so the the paper, which was jointly published by researchers from Virginia Tech, the University of Electronic Science and Technology in China, and Microsoft Research. Um, those of us who have been around the internet for a while, and certainly you know you and I, Leo will recognize the play on words where the paper's title was all your GPS are belong to us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, it was all your base, right? All your base, all your base are belong, belong to us. Yes. Yes. It was a so, poorly translated video game. Right. So this is all your GPS are belong to us. The subtitle was towards stealthy manipulation of road navigation systems. So essentially what's happened is as a consequence of this research, the GPS spoofing state of the art. Somebody has set us up the bomb. We get signal. Uh, what? Main screen. Turn on. This is the game. Ah, how are your base are belong to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that became an internet meme yes. that was quite entertaining for yes. some time. All your base are belong to All us. Your base yes. Belong to us. From <laughs> Zero Wing, a game that came out in 1989. Okay. Yeah, so it's a pretty old meme. Yeah. But it, so, it's and, still but it wonderful. lives on. Lives on. Lives on. So, um, okay, so. Um, what these guys did was to take off-the-shelf, readily available equipment. Um, they said, we show that adversaries can build a portable spoofer, uh, that is to say a GPS spoofer, with low cost. They say about $223, which can easily penetrate the car body to take control of the GPS navigation system. Our measurements show that effective spoofing range is 40 to 50 meters, and the target device can consistently latch onto the false signals without losing connections. The results suggest that adversaries can either place the spoofer 
inside or under the target car and remotely control the spoofer or follow the target car in real time to prevent to perform spoofing. So uh, it, the, the spoofer hardware was four components, a hack RF1 based front end, which is the software defined radio, a Raspberry Pi a portable power source. In this case, it's a rechargeable battery and an antenna. Um, it fits in a small box, uh, like and like f smaller than the the length of a pen, which they showed in their photo to give some sense of scale, um, and just uses readily off the shelf equipment. What what they did, the way they went further than had been before, was that. GPS, you know, like fouling up GPS has been possible, but but essentially replacing valid GPS navigation data with spoofed navigation data, which could be acted on, had never been done before. And that's what these guys did. So one can imagine, I mean, we, we, we've, we've talked about how as autonomous vehicles happen, um, uh, interstate um, and, you know, like cross-country uh, truck driving may end up being replaced by automation. And <clears throat> certainly uh, the GPS system would be one of the main signals that, that these systems would take in. So you could imagine a scenario, and I'm sure it'll be the subject of fiction if it isn't already. Well, now it's much less fictional than it was where a high-value cargo was rerouted literally by get, by not coming into contact with it uh, with the 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 self-driving truck in any fashion, but by spoofing its GPS so that it thought it was somewhere that it wasn't and causing it to take a wrong turn literally and then continue on a course to a alternative spoofed site. That's what these people did. They developed the technology. They, they came up with a system which, when tested against 40 humans, 38 of the 40 did not detect anything amiss. That is, they were following their turn-by-turn -turn navigation. Uh, everything looked fine. They believed what their navigation system was telling them, and this system managed to bring them to a destination w well away from where they were intending to go. So, again, it's not difficult to imagine this being put to various nefarious ends. So the state of the art has jumped from something that, you know, like, where your navigation system is clearly wrong, and many people have had, you know, mapping software fail and tell them to drive off the pier, and they say, uh, "No, I don't, <laughs> I don't think I want to do that." Um, in this case, it just tells them to take a turn or a series of turns, where, where everything they're doing matches the map that they're being seen, but they're not where. They're, they're not at the destination they believe. So interesting piece of work uh, by, that, by those three groups. And um, they, they talk about the, the need to harden GPS and navigation. That is not to just blindly believe the positioning information that we receive because uh, as this demonstrates, it, it can't be believed. Back in uh, November... GitHub announced a very cool new service for the, uh, the maintainers of various repositories, which they said was going to be applied to uh, Ruby, JavaScript, and Python, although until last week, Python was, hadn't been implemented. And I don't, I don't, it's not clear to me, except it just, a lot of work probably uh, necessary to get it done, but Ruby gems and JavaScript NPM uh, all had the benefit from last November and, and Python just got it. And what it is, 
is really a, a nifty service that I, I'm, I was delighted. I missed it last November and didn't pick up on it until just now, um, where GitHub is now looking at the manifests of the projects in the repositories and scanning them for known vulnerabilities in the dependent uh, the dependent software packages upon which the the target projects are built. So there's a there's a tab in GitHub the note called the Insights tab, and one of the the subcategories is dependency graph. And what they've been doing for Ruby and JavaScript since November, and are have now added Python projects is taking responsibility you know, within reason for notifying the maintainers of these repositories if at some point in the future a, a vulnerability is discovered in any of the packages that their projects depend upon. Um, so, so, for example, back when they were explaining this in November, they wrote, when GitHub receives a notification of a newly announced vulnerability. We identify public repositories, and then they said, and private repositories that have opted into vulnerability detection that use the affected version of the dependency. Then we send security alerts to owners and people with admin access to the affected repositories. You can also configure security alerts for additional people or teams working in organization-owned repositories. They said, we detect vulnerable dependencies in public repositories by default. Um, and then uh, uh, this looks like they're repeating themselves. Owners of and people with admin access to private repositories can also opt into vulnerability detection for the repository. For more information, see opting into or out of data use for your private repository. So they're, they're not – oh, and they did also note that they will, they will never – um, show the information on this dependency graph page to anybody who's not an admin. So you need to be an admin in order to see it. But so you can, they, they will preact, proactively notify, or if you go to the insights tab under the dependency graph, you will then see for, for projects that qualify a, a clear security warning uh, if you've got a, a project that if your project it depends upon something with a known security vulnerability and they encourage you there to update yourself in order to the latest version that has been fixed. So just a, a note for those who are maintaining projects in GitHub that that's there. And if you weren't aware that uh, they just added that uh, that feature for Python and I wasn't aware of it at all. So I'm glad to have found out. Very cool. Um, OK, now. Uh, Google and Chrome. Um, the the claim is that starting with I think it's Chrome sixty three, a new capability was added, but was disabled by default, and they call it full site isolation. And this week's news is that. Google, Google <laughs> has enabled this site isolation feature for 99% of Chrome's desktop users. Well, I'm using the latest 67.0 point whatever it was. Uh, let's see. Uh, 67.0.3396.99, which is current. And in digging into this, I wasn't enabled yet. Uh, so our listeners can check, and Leo, you can, if you look under, if, if you open Chrome and put Chrome colon forward slash forward slash flags into the URL bar, that, you know, there's just too many of them. So then you need to search, just put the word isolation in, which brings up a, a nice subset of, of individual flags that Chrome knows about. The first one that comes up is named strict site isolation. 
And are you disabled on all of those? Uh, looks like. No, it looks like. Well, let me let me look, look at isolation first. Looks looks like enabled. Disabled, oh. disabled. Okay. Yep. Wait a no, yep. he's disabled for strict site isolation. Yeah. 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 But so the trial uh, opt out is default. The others are default. Yeah. So I don't know why. I mean, th th maybe this is like just about to happen. Um, okay. So, so what they're doing is interesting, uh, which is why we're talking about it. Um, we've we've known that Chrome has adopted a process per tab approach and that Firefox recently has gone to something similar. The idea being that we are we're, that we're trying to minimize the attack surface where we're, uh, what Chrome is doing is utilizing the operating systems interprocess isolation uh, and allowing the browser to inherit that so that tabs are tab so so that so that web pages occupying separate tabs are in separate processes. And that essentially that means that the the renderer for a tab, and that's the thing that reads the page, reads the JavaScript, you know, does everything. Um, it's it's in a process that has no contact with another tab's process and thus renderer. Whereas in the old days, if when you just ran a browser and up came one process, well, inherently there was some risk because you were there was all of the tabs were being shown by a single process. And if something could break out of the out of its own tab, potentially any other any other data currently open in the browser was available. So first thing that Chrome did was to break out a single process per tab. This goes further. This is a single process per site, meaning per domain, and what which means multiple processes per tab if a single tab hosts content from multiple domains. And as we know, many tabs do. Um, you know, if you've got ads in iframes, those are from other domains. Um, now, the reason this is off is that this incurs a significant overhead, and Google's aware of that. So they're saying between a 10 and 20% memory overhead and lots more processes. So so right now, I mean, maybe they've already backed off of it, which is why by the time I saw this happened, it had already been turned off. I don't know. Uh, our listeners can experiment with it if they're interested because it's right there. You put Chrome colon slash slash flags, search for isolation, and there is, you know, strict site isolation. And and Chrome says security it is a security mode that enables site isolation for all sites. When enabled, each renderer process will contain pages from at most one site, that is to say one domain. They say using out of process iframes when needed. Again, meaning that if you have an iframe, the content in that iframe will not be rendered by the pages process. G Chrome will launch a new process to, you know, containing a web rendering engine to render that the contents of that iframe and show it in the tab. So what this does is it really increases security by, by creating process boundaries now with, you know, like sub page process boundaries, but at a potentially significant expense. Um, what's exciting is that, that as part of the announcement of them deciding to go mainstream with this, but it was supposed to be Chrome 67, like today's Chrome is supposed to have this on and you and me, 
uh, or you and I, sorry, <laughs> you and I, Leo, both have them disabled by default. So, yeah. yeah. So uh, maybe it's still coming. Maybe they decided to to take it more slowly. Um, there is an interesting one of the, down toward the bottom was uh, site isolation or this the 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 second one that comes up is site isolation trial opt out. What what Google was going to do was you know with the instrumentation that they have was to just sort of turn this on for some people and monitor what it means for for the browser in the real world. And so what they did was that they offered an opt out override. So for people who didn't want to be like, have this turned on them by Google and suddenly, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I run often with task manager open and I'm like looking at all the Firefox processes and all the, and when I have Chrome open, all the Chrome processes, even when there's like not a lot is going on. And so I'm thinking, wow, if, you know, if you went to a, a frame heavy page with this turned on, uh, you probably have to scroll your task manager, you know, through pages of Chrome.exes in order to see what's going on. So, Oh, well, what I was going to say was there when as part of the announcement, they were so bullish about this that they were planning if this went mainstream to back out of and remove the specter mitigations. That is their feeling was if they could break a page apart into per domain processes then it's no longer necessary to fuzz the JavaScript timers. And they specifically said that the shared array buffers that we were talking about a couple of weeks ago as something, a feature that had been, that was not going to be implemented with WebSM because it just, it allowed high resolution timers to be crafted by crafty JavaScript. Um, they were saying they're going to put shared array buffers, allow them again. And not worry about Spectre because it was only – it was – apparently it was hostile iframes that they worried could break out of local page containment and affect other and, – and get information from the same page. So now they're saying, well, if we, if we move forward – and, and this has like been going on since 63, which is earlier this year. If we move forward and give a process per iframe, then we don't have to worry about hostile iframes and ads and so forth of, you know, hosted content from other domains on, on the main page, having that level of granularity and access. So uh, anyway, it'll be interesting to, to track this. Um, again, anybody who's interested, you can turn it on and see what happens. I haven't done that yet. I'm, I think I will after the podcast because I'm just curious to see. Uh, you have to restart Chrome afterwards so it can come back up in its new mode. Um, uh, it'd be fun, I interesting to see uh, what it means in terms of performance. Um, it's going to slow things down because you're talking about launching processes Um there is some logic in Chrome to recycle existing processes because they recognize it takes a while to launch a process. So, if, so rather than um, a, 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 as you as you move among pages, rather than launching and destroying processes, uh, Chrome probably creates a process pool. But uh, I, I salute them for the work they're doing. I mean, this is the future. Of, of how we stay secure when we're using a browser, which is increasingly becoming our portal to the world, uh, and also needing to to thwart the bad guys. So the idea that this that you could use this rather than browser-based specter mitigations, which as we're seeing, only slow things down, don't really solve the problem. Um, that's that's really encouraging. But at this point, anyway. Uh, I don't know whether they've already said, said ouch and backed off or 
um, maybe it, they're just still uh, may, maybe it was a prospective announcement when they said uh, it was enabled for 99 percent of Chrome desktop users. Or maybe, Leo, you and I are just a small little one percent. Uh, <laughs> I can that see why somehow, they wouldn't want to enable it if, it if it's that much of oh, a hit. Yeah, so I, I'm I'm terrified. surprised that they actually were <laughs> thinking of enabling it uh, by default. Yeah, I mean it is. Yeah, the, it's, uh, you think it's important for security, obviously, right? So it would definitely enhance security. Yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, and and I have a link to uh, uh, a support page in the show notes here uh, under Google Chrome Help. It says on your computer, open Chrome in the address bar at the top. Enter Chrome colon slash slash flags forward slash pound enable site per process Th that's hyphenated and press enter next to str strict site isolation click enable if you don't see strict uh, site isolation update chrome meaning if you don't have the latest and you and i both do leo and then click relaunch uh and so you know they they say under a threat model they said for a one site per process security policy. We assume that an attacker can convince the user to visit a page that exploits a vulnerability in the renderer process, allowing the attacker, and remember, the renderer is a massive interpreter. So, yeah. They said allowing the attacker to run arbitrary code within the sandbox. We also assume that attackers may use speculative side channel attacks, for example, Spectre, to read data within a renderer process. We consider attackers that want to steal information or abuse privileges granted to other websites. So, and then they, they finally said under requirements for this mitigation, they said to support a site per process policy in a multi-process web browser, we need to identify the smallest unit that cannot be split into multiple processes. That is, they don't want to break anything. They said, this is not actually a single page, but rather a group of documents from the same website that have references to each other. Such documents have full script access to each other's content and they must run on a single thread, not concurrently. This group may span multiple frames or tabs, and they may come from multiple subdomains of the same site. So they are saying that you could have multiple tabs from the same site. Those would be, that is from the same domain, those would be safe to share a process. But so they're sort of refactoring the processes and the tabs so that multiple processes might be using the same page but would not be sharing the same renderer, um, which seems like a good thing. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, whether this appears like in the future or whether it's just you know, something that they were experimenting with, but when they actually ran real-world instrumentation, it turned out to be too expensive. Um, okay, so I've been saying for, well, for as long as we've been talking about the universal plug-and-play problems with routers and the fact that routers are now being used uh, increasingly as, as routing nodes on the Internet, that we're all sort of, well, not we all, but those who are blindly ignorant of the fact that their routers have been commandeered and compromised um, are lucky so far that the the hackers are more interested in outward facing DDoS redirections and spoofing and using the routers to anonymize their source than they are interested in what is going on on the LAN side behind the router. Well, it turns out that at least one hacker did get curious. The security firm Recorded Future discovered sensitive military documents being offered for sale on various hacker forums. Um, 
bleeping computer uh, had the had the their in their coverage of this reported that some of the sensitive documents put up for sale, and this is from what Recorded Future had said, include maintenance course books for servicing the MQ-9 Reaper drones, various training manuals describing deployment tactics for improvised explosive devices, an M1 Abrams tank operation manual, uh, a crewman training and survival manual, and a document detailing tank platoon topics. And the hacker was asking between a hundred and fifty and two hundred dollars for these, which is was considered like almost nothing, given how sensitive this imp- some of this information was. Recorded Future said that it engaged the hacker online and discovered that he used Shodan to hunt down Netgear Nighthawk R seven thousand routers that are known to use a default FTP password. Believe it or not, Leo. <laughs> so, so admin, so, admin. Oh, uh, so, so these the people using these routers, and oh by the way, there's four thousand of them. Mm. Um, turned on the FTP server, exposed it to the WAN, and didn't change the default login. So the hacker used the default FTP password to gain access to some of these routers whose owners had not bothered to change the default. Um, Based on the documents and the details he shared online and with the researchers in private conversations, that is with Recorded Future, uh, one such location was the 432nd Aircraft Maintenance Squadron Reaper AMU OIC, whatever that is, stationed at the Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. Uh, Here, writes Bleeping Computer, he used his access to the router to pivot inside the base's network and gain access to a captain's computer, where he stole the MQ-9 Reaper manual and a list of airmen assigned to Reaper AMU, which must be some sort of maintenance unit. Um, the MQ-9 Reaper drones are, it, are some of the most advanced drones around and are used by the U.S. Air Force, the Navy, the CIA, Customs and Border Protection, NASA, and other militaries of other countries. So, uh, and anyway, as I said, the routers um, have default credentials. Um, when... When Netgear was notified of this two years ago in 2016, they responded by putting up a support page with information on how users could change their router's default FTP password, which boggles the mind. Um, I mean, it's, it's I, probably it's, this, they've soldered it in or something. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Just incredible. Oh boy! Uh, again, I'm, you know, gobsmacked, as they say in the UK, that first of all, I mean, uh, I, I have to hold Netgear responsible for for not somehow using a, a random admin and password, which could have just, I mean, like the first time the router comes up. It could see that they're blank and just used random stuff in the for the admin and pa- and and uh, and password fields, which the user could copy and then use if they chose, or change to something that they want them to be if they don't like random gibberish. But to have to have them start up in the firmware as statically global known things. I mean, I it's most just... most routers do that, though. Flink's yes. for years was admin, admin. I know. I know. I mean, and, and, and this is a practice that just has to change. It, ha- it has... It, the, the, the firmware 
should see that they've not been initialized when it comes up and put and and then just based on it, it can use packet noise. I mean, there's there's plenty of sources of entropy available to a router. So I mean, it it I mean now a lot of the new uh, these routers typically use ARM chips and they've got good random number generating hardware in them. So just generate pull some random numbers, put gibberish in there that will annoy the user. Well, which, first of all, the user could copy and use, which would be very good username and passwords, which would never occur again. Or if the user doesn't like them, then they can, you know, change them to be what they want. But, you know, just <laughs> the idea that they're just I mean, it's one thing to to have the the land side admin default to admin admin. But to have the WAN side ever default to anything is unconscionable from from a security standpoint if for you, any uh, router. If you defaulted to uh, WAN administration off, that would do it, right? Well, but clearly these people wanted remote well, access. They turned it on, right? And they turned it on. Yeah. And, I mean, and come with, on, though. The, you got to give give the user some responsibility if you're going to turn on. WAN access and leave the default password, you're kind of at fault, right? I, I don't disagree, except that, that defense in depth is the right. is the is the, the router goal needs to here. Help you, yeah. Yeah. Why not? Why not have it, you know, do everything it I'll can't tell you I mean, it's why not? So trivial. Yeah, but you know why not? Because Netgear doesn't want all those calls from people saying, Hey, I didn't write down that password. Right? I mean, I've reset routers many times because I forgot the administrative password yeah but if it yeah. then which is a, which is a good thing yeah because th th that means that you didn't use the default <laughs> yeah right that's true <laughs> uh, i guess it could do that though if every time it's reset generate a new set new password uh using your method yeah that would be a good thing to do it's just a lot of coding you know that's work yeah oh darn wow <laughs> oh darn <laughs> oh darn <laughs> okay so when BGP abuse becomes sufficiently blatant, even the reluctant to respond with what you know, with with anything anybody could call a a knee jerk reaction, internet managers finally do. So we've talked about BGP routing in the past, and we've talked about mistakes that do happen from time to time. Um, as we know, the the big routers on the internet are uh, they, they they connect to multiple other routers and they build a routing table which instructs them how to forward incoming packets bound for like like trying to go out another one of their connections. So what happens is when a when the the router has a table of routes that it knows how to forward packets for it it advertises that in this border gateway protocol BGP. So that allows the route the other routers it's connected to to know that oh if they for if they're if the packet is bound for somewhere else where should they forward their traffic to? So this is this is the way that the internet self organizes, and it's brilliant. And what it really does is it it actually organizes itself. Which thank goodness we have technology to do that. Otherwise, it would be always be broken and out of date and so forth. Um, so when a router is like when 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 someone hooks up a new IP subnet to a router the they they say okay this range of ips is going to be connected to this interface that goes off to this customer so that that update propagates through using bgp it propagates far enough out until the until that subnet becomes incorporated by a larger subnet that 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 means that the route doesn't need to propagate any further. In, in, in other words, 
the and we've talked about this how the 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 cl the classless interdomain routing where you look at the an IP address as a prefix and a suffix where you can route everything with the same prefix to the same destination hugely simplifies this task. Okay, so we're only human, we people who maintain routers on the internet, and from time to time a mistake gets made. So when that happens, somebody entering into the router where, you know, which range of IPs this new interface should be connected to might put a typo in. And the router doesn't know it's a typo. It says, oh, okay, I'm now in charge of this block of IPs. They go out that interface. So just as ha happens when it's the right news, it happens when it's the wrong news. And so suddenly... An advertisement, as these things are called, these updates are called, an advertisement goes out advertising that it is responsible for a block of IPs it is not actually in charge of. And, you know, there's no, like, overlord. It's all sort of a peer agreement system where everybody hopes not to do any typos and things more or less work, except they don't. Then something breaks and then suddenly, you know, all of the Internet gets routed to some one location that melts down because it's way too much traffic for it. And they go, whoops, and they remove that that uh, mistake from the routing table and then the Internet repairs itself and we go back to business as usual. Unless it's done deliberately and there's nothing to prevent this being done deliberately. Um, as we've discussed over the years, there's a lot of the internet that is still dark. There are a lot of people squatting on IP allocations that eh, they may grow into over time. There have been some, some great companies like Hewlett Packard that had three, I think it was class A networks and gave a couple of them back, uh, thus releasing, you know, a, was it 16 million IPs back to, uh, the, the world essentially for reallocation and, 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 you know, things like that, or companies that have been able to, you know, that we're sitting on a class A and realize, you know, we're never going to need 16 million. So they read, they, pushed themselves all down toward one end and then gave up half of their allocation. Thank you very much. But what there still are are lots of small little bits all over the place, which which nobody, the owners don't want to give up because they might legitimately grow into them. And they're not making any more IPv4 IPs, as they say. So uh, people are holding on to the ones they've got. Okay, so it turns out that for years, a, a BGP provider, an exchange port, uh, an, yeah, a, a, an exchange uh, provider in Portugal named BitCanal has been uh, reselling, for lack of a better term, uh, profiting from, certainly, IPs that it doesn't own. It's been advertising, de deliberately advertising small blocks of IPs that, that its router then says it owns. And because they're small, they tend not to get coalesced with other prefixes, as that's why I mentioned this before which allows them to stay separate as they as they propagate because they're just small little like like you know uh, uh, slash 24 networks that don't stand out very much and and also they also sort of tend to stay off of people's radars that way they're, they're just little bits of of space that that are slack in the system that that everybody knows about but they're sort of where they're supposed to be. So Nanog, N-A-N-O-G, 
is the North American Network Operators Group. And uh, uh, Ronald uh, Gulmet started off his posting to the Nanog mailing list saying, I mean, seriously, WTF. <laughs> and then he went on to say, as should be blatantly self-evident to pretty much everyone. And Leo, if, you, if you're at this place in the show notes, I have a paste bin link that's worth clicking on uh, just to show the, these are the, the current misallocation of IPs by this Portugal-based, this BitCanal ISP. These are the IPs that they have stolen from the internet. Statically, they have them. He says, as should be blatantly self-evident to pretty much everyone who has ever looked at any of the internet's innumerable prior incidents of very deliberately engineered IP space hijackings, all of the routes currently being announced by AS3266, and, and AS, that's the autonomous system number of BitCanal, and he says, parens BitCanal, comma, Portugal, except for the ones in 213-8, and so that's the, that's the one network that they are entitled to, he says, are bloody obvious hijacks. Wow. He says, that's 39 deliberately hijacked routes, at least going by the data visible on bgp.he.net. But even that data from bgp.he.net dramatically understates the case, I'm sorry to say. According to the more complete up-to-the-minute data that I just now fetched from RipeStat, the real number of hijacked routes is more on the order of 130 separate hijacked routes for a total of 224,512 IPv4 addresses. And then the paste bin link. He says, in simpler terms, BitCanal has made off with the rough equivalent of an entire slash 14 block of IPv4 addresses that never belonged to them. And of course, they haven't paid a dime to anyone for any of that space. Anyway, he alleges, and I think it's pretty clear it's the case, that BitCanal is doing all of this, this hijacking of BGP routes for the purpose of reselling, and in fact, mm. they know for a fact, reselling the hijacked IP addresses to spammer groups, which yeah, in turn use them. Yep. Because they don't care if the address stops working after a while. Exactly. Yeah. They just want... IPs that are not in the current blacklists. Right. And so, th so this allows them to, to establish connections to SMTP servers from unknown IPs and, uh, you know, to stay hidden that way. So anyway, the, the, po the upshot is this finally went, this finally rose to the level where, where and again, the, it, it's just like we've seen with, um, you know, uh, uh, Google making moves very deliberately, but also in a very considered fashion, uh, or the larger, uh, the, the larger industry pulling a certificate authorities rights to sign. I mean, you have to really, you know, you have to really be bad in order to, to have the industry say, okay, look, you know, you, you 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 made a mistake. You didn't report it. You lied about it when we told you. You did. Then you didn't tell us about the other things that you found out that you also did. Blah 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 blah. I mean, we we've talked about this through the years. Um, what finally happened was they went dark. The internet said goodbye, and basically no longer routes any traffic to that Portugal-based ISP, nor accepts any from them. They are out of business as a consequence. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll see a drop in spam, which would be a nice side effect of that. Yeah. Um, and I did finally want to finish up. I wanted to follow up from, 
uh, a comment last week. Uh, John Doe, as he described himself, writing from Moonbase 17, which I don't think is actually a place. Uh, the subject was uh, M Dad M Raid 6 Spinrite comment. Uh, this was sent on the 12th of, of July. He said, hopefully this gets to you in time or you can forward it to the person that asked the question. Or I can share it on the podcast so that all of our other listeners who may find this interesting, and actually it is kind of cool, uh, may benefit as well. He says, on your last podcast, SN671, there was a question about running Spinrite on a five-disc RAID 6 with MDADM on Linux. If the person turn, uh, get this, here it is. If the person turns on write intent bitmaps, then the rebuild time can often be reduced to a few minutes when a drive is put back into the RAID. He says, I see five to 10 minute resyncs. Um, I have a link in the show notes to uh, the RAID wiki kernel.org uh, that describes it. And in that uh, write up, they said, when an array has a right intent bitmap, a spindle, they said a device, often a hard drive, can be removed and re added, that can be removed and re added. Then only blocks changed since the removal, as recorded in the bitmap, will be resynced. Um, and and then they add, therefore, a write intent intent bitmap reduces rebuild slash recovery time if the machine crashes crashes with an unclean shutdown or one spindle is disconnected then reconnected. Um, uh, and then they go on to say, write intent bitmap support is only available for RAID geometries causing data redundancy. For example, as RAID 0 has no redundancy, it cannot be inconsistent. So there's nothing to record in such a bitmap. But anyway, this was very, this was very cool. Uh, what it means is that while the drive is offline with Spinrite running on it, um, the RAID can continue to stay up. It can continue to function. And... When the when the spin written drive is is rejoins the raid, the 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 write intent bitmaps will be compared, and an essentially an incremental update will be made to the rejoined drive that only takes a few minutes and avoids a full ra raid rebuild. So thank you very much for the tip. And for anybody who's interested, uh, it makes it easy then to pull a drive out, let Spinrite run on it, uh, even Spinrite 6 as it is now, and then have it rejoin the rain later without a great impact That's to the cool. rain. So know about very that. cool. That's really fast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you want to take a break before we uh, move on? Yep. Because right. we're going to now talk about us being all up in their business. <laughs> up in their business. <laughs> our show today <laughs> don't let them get up in your business our show today is brought to you by duo security the leader in trust no one they call it zero trust secure access for the enterprise steve calls it tno duo simplifies the path to a zero trust beyond corp security environment i don't know if you're familiar with that concept of beyond corp but that's that's you can actually read the white papers on Beyond Corp Zero Trust. It shifts access controls from the perimeter to individual devices and users, which allows employees to work securely from any location without the need for a traditional VPN. Duo simplifies that path, uh, allowing secure connections to all applications based on the trustworthiness of the user and the device, which means you can set and enforce risk-based adaptive access policies Get enhanced visibility into the user's devices and activities. Embrace mobility and bring your own device, BYOD, while making your users happy with frictionless, secure access. It's kind of the best of both worlds. Duo Beyond grants access to cloud and on-premises apps without clunky VPMs or MDM. It's a, just a simple and effective way to adopt a zero-trust security model in your enterprise. Duo Beyond verifies the identity of all your users with effective, strong, multi-factor authentication before, of course, they have any access to your enterprise apps or resources. 
It, you, and as as the uh, as the uh, IT person, you'll love it because you get visibility into what's going on, into every device used to access corporate apps, whether or not you got corporate management on that device. So you don't need to actually put device management agents in play. It ensures that every device that's accessing your corporate network or uh, or resources or applications is trustworthy. Every device is inspected automatically to uh, whenever it's used to access corporate applications or resources in real time at the time of access to determine their security posture and trustworthiness. It's really kind of remarkable. You can enforce risk-based and adaptive access policies, protect every application by using Duo Beyond to define policies that limit access to those users, those devices that meet your organization's risk tolerance levels. And then you've got insured uh, secure connections to all the applications through a uniform, easy, frictionless interface accessible from anywhere. This is what you want. Find out more about Enterprise Security and Beyond Corp. Adopt that zero trust security model today with Duo Beyond. Visit duo.com, D U O.com to learn more and sign up for a free trial. That's D U O, Duo. Dot com. Zero trust, complete confidence. We've got a 30-day trial waiting for you at duoduo.com. Mr. Zero Trust Gibson is here. Yes. <laughs> he Leo, um, you would have fun uh, pronouncing the Russian names uh, of these I agents. I love it. I love I, it. I, <laughs> yes. It's always fun. I have, I have. I, however, am, am unable to do that. Viktor Borisovich news... Nitkisho, <laughs> Boris Alexeyevich Antonov, Dmitry Sergeyevich Badin. I love it. You're right. I am having fun. I, I knew you would. Whew. The good news is uh, their first names are almost unique. There's Viktor, Boris, Dmitry, <laughs> Ivan, Alexei, Sergey, Nikolay, Pavel, Artem, Alexander, Alexei, and Anatoly. Sounds like the there, bridge of the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> well, there are two Alexis. So there's a little bit of the, there. There's Ale, Ale, Alexei uh, Lukashev, yeah, Lukashev and, and Potemkin. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, so other than that, they their names are unique. Um, what what I as, and as I said at the top of the show, I, I didn't. I, I I was gonna talk about I was gonna title this podcast Specter 1.1 1.2 or Specter keeps delivering or something, but I read the 29 page indictment and my I was just stunned by the level of detail that that it alleges about the behavior of these agents and I mean. It's it's amazing and um and it's so got their addresses what yes. the, you know the unit they're in command of what yes. they did it feels like we had a tap in here right it feels uh, like we well were... uh, the only thing I could think is that it, to be able to do this retrospectively th um, the NSA and I guess it makes sense. That's what sure. that be huge so server farm, the, yeah. the hard drive farm in in Utah is doing, is is literally recording all traffic, maybe not interstate, but international. Um, that is, it must be that the trunks coming in and out of the United States are just it, they're just being recorded. Um, Which, by the, the way, I just want to point out, there's a reason why there's all this detail in the indictments. It's just a little warning shot, isn't it, for anybody yes. else who might be involved? That we know yes, everything. I, I, I'm so as I'm as I'm reading this, I, I'm just I'm stunned by the level of yeah. of what is understood. First yeah. of all, the, the the it starts out with those twelve people. It names them each and describes their job functions and their lines of reporting and which aspects of the hacking they were involved in. So it sort of gives you a per a per defendant overview of of who did what. Um, uh, we rarely and, see this kind of detail when you hear about a hack. 
I mean, they talk about exactly how they executed it. It's yes. amazing. It, 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 yes, and um, and I, I I highlighted. I didn't want to go through. I mean, I I got overly ambitious you, you as I was just pulling you pasted the entire indictment into the show I, notes. I know. <laughs> I, I I was trying to skip things, but and I won't drag our listeners through it. But but for example, uh, well, actually, it uh, it, it reads. Um, for example, on or about March 19th, 2016, uh, Lukashev, and I don't remember his, fir his first name, uh, he was, where is he? Alexei. Um, Alexei. <laughs> and Lukashev, his not Potemkin. Get the right Lukashev. <laughs> right. Get the right uh, Alexei. Right. He, he's yeah. he's the, the, uh, the, we have to disambiguate him. <laughs> yes. Created and sent a spear fit. Now get this. On March 19th, this guy in Russia and his co-conspirators created and sent a spear phishing email to the chairman of the Clinton campaign. Alexei used the account John356GH at an online service that abbreviated lengthy website addresses referred to as a UL shortening service. Alexei used the account to mask a link contained in wow. the spear phishing email, which directed the recipient to a GRU created website. Alexi altered the appearance of the sender email address in order to make it look like the email was a security notification from Google, a technique known as spoofing, instructing the user to change his password by clicking the embedded link. Those instructions were followed. On or about March 21st, um, 2016, Alexei and Yermakov, I don't I forgot his first name, and co-conspirators stole the contents of the chairman's email account, which consisted of over 50,000 emails. Uh, and it goes on like that. On or about March 20th, we have a March 19th, March 25th, uh, 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 Alexi used the same John 356 GH account to mask additional links, including in included in spear phishing emails sent to numerous individuals affiliated with the Clinton campaign, including victims one and two. And those were, uh, earlier described, um, uh, in, in the, uh, indictment, uh, he, uh, uh, Alexei sent these emails from the Russia-based email account hi.mymail at yandex.com that he spoofed to appear to be from Google. Mm. Um, uh, here, and then I've jumped down again and I highlighted something else. On or about April 6th, the conspirators created an email account in the name with a one-letter deviation from the actual spelling of a known member of the Clinton campaign. The conspirators then used that account to spend to send spear phishing emails to the work accounts of more than 30 different Clinton campaign employees. In the spear phishing emails, Alexei and his conspirators embedded a link purporting to direct the recipient to a document titled Hillary hyphen Clinton hyphen favorable hyphen hyphen rating dot XLSX. In fact, this link directed the recipient's computers to a GRU created website. And it goes on like that. Um, at one point, and they're not clear here about the network penetration. They said beginning in or around March 20, 2016, the conspirators, in addition to their spear phishing efforts, researched the DCCC and DNC computer networks to identify technical specifications and vulnerabilities. Now, okay, think about that. They, these guys, in addition to the spear phishing, researched the computer networks to identify technical specifications and vulnerabilities. How do we know? I mean, the, the level of detail here demonstrates we do, as they're about to explain, but it's amazing to me um, th because this wasn't – I mean this is not something that uh, we know from the, the reporting and actually from what's in this indictment that it wasn't until sometime later 
that the presence of malware was discovered and then company one as it's as it's called in this indictment was a security firm that was brought in to figure out what was going on this company one almost cleaned things up but left behind the, this ex agent malware in a Linux machine that allowed them to maintain pers a persistent presence in the network. But they said, for example, for example, beginning on or about March 15th, uh, uh, and, uh, Yermakov, I guess that's still Alexei, ran a technical query for the DNC's internet protocol configurations to identify connected devices. Now, I can't technically disentangle what that actually means, but that, meant, that means something. On or about the same day, this Yermakov, Alexei, searched for open source information about the DNC network, the Democratic Party and Hillary Clinton. So I think in this case, they don't mean open source software. They mean like did Google searches. And in fact, there are instances later where they list the search terms that were used in their searches before, as I mentioned at the top of the show, generating a blog post under this Guccifer 2.0 moniker. Um, on April 7th, he ran a technical query for the DCCs, the DCCs, Internet Protocol Configurations, to identify connected devices. And what we do know is that, um, oh, in or, in or around April, within days of Alexi's searches regarding the DCCC, the conspirators hacked into the DCCC computer network. Once they gained access, they installed and managed different types of malware to explore the DCCC network and steal data. On April 12th, they used the stolen credentials of a DCCC employee, who was identified here as empl DCCC employee 1, to access the DCCC network. Employee 1 had received a spear phishing email from the conspirators on April 6th and entered her password after clicking on the link. Between in or around April 2016 and June 2016, the conspirators installed multiple versions of their agent, I'm sorry, their ex agent malware on at least 10 DCCC computers, which allowed them to monitor individual employees' computer activity, steal passwords, and maintain access to the DCCC network. Now, probably some of this came from that company one, the security firm that was brought in while this was ongoing. And so uh, I'm sure that the, the DOJ researchers you know, contacted them and said, OK, tell us everything you know about what you found when you went over to uh, the campaign networks and, and looked around. But anyway, this goes on like that. There's multiple instances of malware. There is an instance where uh, somebody, I think it was on the DNC network, had access to the DCCC network. They installed keystroking and screenshot functions um, oh, yeah, here, ex-agent malware implanted on the DCCC network transmitted information from the victim's computers to a GRU leased server located in Arizona. So they, were, they weren't even uh, exfiltrating directly from the U.S., but going to another server in Arizona. Uh, there's also one, uh, I think it's in Indiana. The conspirators referred to this server as their AMS panel. Um, uh, Kozachek and uh, Malyshev and their co-conspirators logged into the AMS panel to use ex-agents key log and screenshot functions in the course of monitoring and surveilling activity on the DCC, on the DCCC computers. The key log function allowed the conspirators to capture keystrokes entered by DCCC employees. The screenshot, screenshot function allowed the conspirators to take pictures of the DCCC employees' computer screens, as you know, we understand all that. Um, they, uh, they also used a relay known as the middle server um, that was located somewhere else. I've skipped over that. Um, I'm just looking for anything else that's particularly interesting. Uh, 
I mean, in terms of details, um, they were uh, ex- they were proactively covering their logs and cleaning things up. They even used sea cleaner, Leo, at one point in an attempt to to clean off well, the uh, evidence <laughs> of their activity. Oh, yeah, yeah, Il- Il- Illinois, on or about April 28th, they connected to and tested uh, a computer uh, located in Illinois using what was described as X-Tunnel. So it sounds like they had some sort of a VPN or an encrypted tunneling system. They also uh, used... Um, sort of reverse engineering some of the um, non-specific language in the document. They used open source uh, a compression tool to archive, in some cases, gigabytes worth of documents and then exfiltrated them through this X-Tunnel software, which was installed on the machine in Illinois uh, in order to take it out. Oh, and get this, on and get, and like, how do they know? Between on or about May 25th and June 1st, so a period of, what, about a week, um, the conspirators hacked the DNC Microsoft Exchange server, and that's understandable, and that isn't how, how, that, how they might know that from records, and stole thousands of emails from the work accounts of DNC employees. But here it is. During that time, Aletsky, who's very busy, researched... PowerShell commands related to accessing and managing Microsoft Exchange servers. So, you know, as I said, we really were all up in their business in order to, like, have this level of detail of the things they were doing behind the scenes on their end to prepare for what we know they were doing at our end, apparently based on logs that somebody had somewhere because it sure seems like, you know, the, 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 the democratic election group were clueless about a lot of this, um, uh, deleted logs, uh, despite the conspirators efforts to hide their activity beginning in or around May of 2016, both the DCCC and DNC became aware that they had been hacked and hired a security company, Company One, as as that's referred to here, to identify the extent of the intrusions. By in or around June, Company One took steps to exclude intruders from the networks. Despite these efforts, a Linux-based version of XAgent, programmed to communicate with the GRU registered domain LinuxKernel.net, uh, that's KRNL.net remained on the DNC network until in or around October of 2016. Um, And they talk about uh, keystroke logging, tons of snapshots, uh, how that that they then uh, created, uh, it says, oh, they even found them, they they know when they were unable to get something that they wanted, suggesting that it wasn't just monitoring DNC networks. Um, in or around September of 2016, they successfully gained access to DNC computers hosted on a third-party cloud computing service. These computers contained test applications related to the DNC's analytics. After conducting reconnaissance, the conspirators gathered data by creating backups or snapshots of the DNC's cloud-based systems using the cloud provider's own technology. They then moved the snapshots to cloud-based accounts they had registered with the same service, thereby stealing the data from the DNC. And also, more than a month before the release of any documents, the conspirators constructed the online persona DC Leaks to release and publicize stolen election-related documents, on or about April 19th, after attempting to register the domain electionleaks.com, the conspirators registered the domain dcleaks.com. So, okay, how, how, how can anyone know that they attempted but failed to register the domain electionleaks.com? Uh, it's mind-boggling. So, anyway, they got dcleaks.com through a service that anonymized the registrant. 
And we don't know if that's TOR or what, but maybe. The funds used to pay for the DC Leaks domain originated from an account that an online an account at an online cryptocurrency service that the conspirators also used to fund the lease of a virtual private server registered with the operational email account D-I-R-B-I-N-S-A-A-B-O-L at mail.com. The Durbin Sabal email account was also used to register that John 356GH URL shortening account used by our friend Alexi to spearfish the Clinton campaign chairman and other related individuals. So, and, and this is something we've seen before where any, any linkages between what would uh, appear to be otherwise separate events, any reuse of IPs, of, of email accounts, of, of obscure domains and so forth, that can be used if you have like encyclopedic knowledge of every packet that transited the internet during that time, <laughs> you know, you can figure all this out. But I don't know how you do this short of having that kind of visibility into internet traffic. Uh, to me, this suggests there is a level of surveillance far in excess of of what I at least have assumed was technically feasible. It's amazing. Um, Does it give they, you a, uh, a little cause for, you know, concern? Because Well, I'm, I would be concerned <laughs> if I was Alexi. Yeah, like, but I I'd mean, be looking wonder, over my shoulder. I mean, do you think they have this level of detail about everything that's happening? Uh, uh, <laughs> you, you know, uh... <laughs> It certainly does Yikes. suggest that we that the future will be interesting. Yikes! Um, yeah, wow. Uh, on or about June fourteenth, the DNC through Company One, remember that's their the security company they brought in, publicly announced that it had been hacked by Russian government actors. In response, the conspirators created the online persona Guccifer two point and falsely claimed to be a lone Romanian hacker to undermine the allegations of Russian responsibility for the intrusion. On June 15th, the conspirators, and here again, get this, logged into a Moscow-based server used and managed by unit, and I haven't talked about the unit numbers, there's two different unit numbers, uh, two, five, something or other, but this one is, 74455 and we know the street addresses and you know like where the nearest Starbucks is it's just amazing uh, between 419 p.m. and 456 p.m. Moscow Standard Time from unit after just having gotten some lattes uh, at unit 7455 they searched for certain words and phrases between 4.19 p.m. and 4.56, including, quote, some hundreds of sheets, DC leaks, Illuminati, worldwide known, think twice about, and companies' competence. Later that day, at 7.02 p.m. Moscow Standard Time, the online persona, Guccifer 2.0, published its first post on a blog site created through WordPress titled, quote, DNC's servers hacked by a lone hacker, unquote. The post used numerous English words and phrases that the conspirators had searched for earlier that day which is to say between 4.19 p.m. and 4.56 p.m., three hours further er, er, earlier, they made sure their English was correct when they made the Guccifer 2.0 posting alleging that, no, it, I, I'm just some guy in Romania. Um, it's the, this says the conspirators conducted operations as Guccifer 2.0 and DC leaks using overlapping computer infrastructure and financing. In other words, again, 
there were collisions. Uh, there is a, a, I skipped some of the details, but um, here's one. To facilitate the purchase of infrastructure used in their hacking activity, including hacking into the computers of U.S. persons and entities involved in the 2016 U.S. presidential election and releasing the stolen documents, the defendants conspired to launder the equivalent of more than $95,000 through a web of transactions structured to capitalize on the perceived anonymity of cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. And I'll skip a bunch of this because there's a whole bunch of Bitcoin stuff. But for example, the conspirators used several dedicated email accounts to track basic Bitcoin transaction information and to facilitate Bitcoin payments to vendors. One of these dedicated accounts registered with the username G. Fatal 47 received hundreds of Bitcoin payment requests from approximately 100 different email accounts. For example, on or about February 1st, 2016, the G Fatal 47 account received the instruction to, quote, please send exactly 0.026043. Bitcoin to, unquote, a certain 34-character Bitcoin address. Shortly thereafter, a transaction exactly ma or exact uh, matching those exact instructions was added to the blockchain. So, again, this is where we see Bitcoin payments not actually being untraceable and anonymous if you have complete S yeah. visions, com complete sight of everything going on. Um, anyway, and I, and I finished. The last piece of this I grabbed was, on occasion, the conspirators facilitated Bitcoin payments using the same computers that they used to conduct their hacking activity, including to create and send test spear phishing emails. Additionally, one of these dedicated accounts was used by the conspirators in or around 2015 to renew the registration of a domain, that's that Linux kernel.net, encoded in certain X agent malware installed on the DNC network. So, so we so we know a few things uh, after a reading of this indictment. Um, we know that standard, kind of like off the shelf in the sense that we've talked about it on this podcast for years. Um, Social engineering attacks, spear phishing, email spoofing, um, link following uh, was the way they got in. They, um, they researched people uh, to design email campaigns, which would be convincing. Uh, they managed to get some unwitting DNC employee to click a link, which was pretending to be a Google security advisory. Uh, please re-enter your password in order to prove your you. That got them. That that allowed them to get the person's password, and then they were able to get into the network. And once there, they transferred uh, remote access trojans onto the network, and then from that point spread onto at least 10 different machines. There, there was somewhere else I didn't read here, but it's in the show notes if anyone's cares. But it's also in the, I have a link, by the way, to the PDF. It's 29 pages, the, the entire indictment, if anyone is interested. Um, uh, but they know how many machines in each of the two networks, the DCCC and the DNC, uh, there was malware found on. Um, they uh, established a presence in the U.S. where they, they had other staging machines. They used Bitcoin in order to register domains and to pay for the various services that were available. Uh, used uh, anonymizing services. Uh, used VPN or some sort of a tunneling s system in order to get the data out. So all of that is sort of by the book. Um, you know, I mean, this is the danger that that any organization is in that is targeted. And that is, you know, we talked about it with the Sony hack where, well, one executive assistant clicked the wrong link 
And that's all it took in order to set up an advanced persistent threat inside of Sony and then um, cause all the damage that they did. So the the human factor is still the weak link. Um, so there's that. So it was interesting to read this indictment from the standpoint of, you know, what exactly was done? Is there anything new or surprising or like what? How did that happen? And from the from the angle of what they did in order to perpetrate this intrusion, no, we we learned nothing. In fact, we know the names of these things that are you know anonymized in this indictment, pretty much. What is shocking is what we know, and Leo. <laughs> As you said, total I mean, information awareness. Remember that? Yes. James Clapper. Yes. Yeah. It is just astonishing. <laughs> and whoa. Um, so, yeah, it it has to be that last Friday when this went public, um, the GRU uh, in these two, the agents in these two units said, whoa. Um, first of all, their mistakes were highlighted. The, the, the instances where any overlap in infrastructure or, or uh, email accounts, I mean, anything they reused was linked back together in order to build this web and build this case. And really, that's what that, If even if we can't read the labels on the diagram, which is our picture of the week, that's what that is. That's a web of interconnection that demonstrates, you know, what the various actors were doing, what roles they had, you know, what they registered and when and how they paid for it. And, and, and I mean, just like, wow. And I think the, and the, I think the case, you, you could make the case, though, that while we have this total information awareness, it took uh, a special prosecutor and the Mueller investigation yes. to take these disparate uh, silos of information and 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 as you say knit them together there was a great movie with sean connery uh called the anderson tapes uh, he he plays the leader uh, the ringleader of a gang that uh, robs a whole apartment building and uh there's recordings there's phone taps they have the whole story but at the end of the movie all the agencies with all the f illegal taps and all the information decided rather than prosecute just let's just erase all the tapes, and the movie ends with the tapes being erased because no. But see it, that. So I have a feeling that we could do this with almost any situation if you could get somebody with the extra legal ability and powers to, yeah. to say, "I need this. I need this. I need this." That's why you get a hundred subpoenas at a time, right? Yeah. Well, and as I said, I'm sure that the company that was brought in to the DNC, that the the so-called Company One. I'm sure they they've turned over all the records they had okay. of what they found. There were 140 but, servers. There was cloud, you know. But there's more than that. There's a, there's clearly surveillance, right? Because Leo, retrospectively, yeah. that's just it. Is like, I mean, they were talking about the way this began, not the way it ended. Right. Which yeah, is no, they, like oh. they knew how they did it. Yes, but I mean, I guess you'd leave a breadcrumbs if you knew where to look. You'd see it. Especially if you're recording everything. <laughs> well, but but also to know that they they logged into their own machines to perform to perform searches yeah. of English phrases yeah. that suggests we're up I think, in, yes, their we're up in their business. Their business, yeah. yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. The people reading this most closely are the GRU, right? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> they're they're <laughs> they're thinking time to stop using Windows. Right, right. <laughs> oh. Hey, by the way, during this very show, I want to say uh, congratulations to Semsticks. He's a geocacher, and he found our Twit geocache. His comment from today found while listening to Security Now Live. Glad to see Leo is a geocacher. TFTC. <laughs> Very cool. So he's listening. Our geocache is outside in the parking lot. I didn't see him do it, but he but he must have gone and found the geocache. He was listening on headphones live. So he, I presume he still are, Sam Sticks. Enjoy. <laughs> um, you know, and this does... Uh, it's It's hard for law enforcement after seeing this to argue that they don't have sufficient visibility as it is now. Oh, yeah. I mean, 
No, they it's didn't like, go dark. Oh no. Yeah, uh, it's like <laughs> oh, where, no. where's the where's the darkness? <laughs> I don't see any darkness. I, did here. I tell you we had Phil Zimmerman on a few a couple weeks ago on Triangulation, the creator of PGP. Yeah, and uh, he said this is this is like and by the way, it's called Zimmerman's Law. That as technology advances, the ability to surveil advances at the same rate. He says, it's like they have a giant big screen TV and they can see everything. There's just one or two dark pixels, the, the encrypted phones, things like that. And they don't like any, you know, they don't want any black pixels. That's actually, that's a great Isn't analogy. Isn't that a good analogy? Really that really yeah. is a good analogy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Clearly, there's, there's little they're missing. Wow. What a great, uh, great piece! Thank you. I appreciate you talking about this. Very interesting. Well, again, I, I didn't. I, you, it would have been easy to gloss over it and say, "Oh, they know a lot." But I, th I thought, as it, what hit me was the level of detail yeah. and the dates and the times. Right. Oh, yeah, but you know, in the afternoon they did this, and then that evening, three hours later, they did that. It's like, whoa! One story okay. you did miss, but I just wanted to mention uh, election systems and software is a company that. Uh, maintains the counting stuff at the you know the county seats of all the voting. They'd uh -huh. been putting PC anywhere on their counting machines. Oh, I know the remote access. <laughs> I just saw that. I yeah. Uh, Ron Wyden, uh, Senator Wyden's uh, sent him a letter yep. in April saying, um, "Is there remote access software on our election um, boxes?" Oh yeah. Starting in uh, in uh, two thousand, in a small number of cases, oh, <laughs> a small goodness. number of cases. Yeah. Uh, what could possibly go wrong? Well, and then I didn't remember this, but apparently PC Anywhere's source code had been hacked around that time frame. Uh, even though uh, Symantec didn't tell anybody till six years later. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it had been stolen years earlier. <laughs> Steve, you did it again. Thank you, sir. I'm sure there will be more to talk about next week as we continue to get all up in their business. <laughs> we are never running out of things to talk about, Leo. <laughs> My pleasure, and we'll see you next week. Yes, sir. The show airs. Uh, we do it live. You can watch us make it live. Even if you're geocaching, you can listen as we're doing it live. Uh, every uh, Wednesday, I'm sorry, Tuesday, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, 2030 UTC. Join us in studio, if you wish. We have a a visitor from Northern Ireland here today. It's nice to have you. Uh, all you got to do is email tickets at twit.tv or no matter where you are in the world, you can go to our live streams at twit.tv slash live. There's audio and video. After the show's over, our editors get to work and uh, Steve posts an audio version of the show followed a few days later by a, a transcript written by Elaine Ferris. She does a great job so you can read along as you listen. We have audio and video at our site, too. Steve's site is grc.com. Go there, by the way, not only to get the podcast, but to get SpinRight, the world's best hard drive recovery and maintenance utility, grc.com. And there's all sorts of other stuff there, too. It's really a treasure trove of... It's like being inside Steve's brain. Uh, our site, twit.tv slash sn. And, of course, it's on every podcast application. You can even listen on your Amazon Echo or your Google Home. Just ask for security now you'll get the most recent episode thank you steve we'll see you next week pleasure my friend until then security.